The next item of business is a debate on motion 9529, the name of Angela Constance on Affairs of Scotland delivering race equality. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion. Ms Constance, nine minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. In March last year, we published the Race Equality Framework, setting out this government's long-term ambitions to create a more inclusive, equal society for our minority ethnic communities. Since then, the, the world has changed and the months following the EU referendum, we've seen a, a growth of racially motivated hate crime, predominantly south of the border. Uh, but here in Scotland, there is a, a growing sense of unease and uncertainty in some of our communities uh, about the future. And we've also seen an increase in racial tensions globally, uh, people vilified because of their ethnicity and skin colour. And added to this, we've seen a trend in the promotion and growth of abhorrent ideologies uh, peddled by right-wing groups which we thought were extinct. Who would have thought that in 2017 we would see people giving Nazi salutes at rallies and demonstrations in the US and elsewhere, and to do so uh, with impunity? And what recent events have taught us is that long-term objectives are not enough to counter the forces which seek to sow discord and disharmony. And what we need is action and change, and that is what we will deliver. Last December, I appointed Ms. Callie Annie Lyle as our independent race equality advisor. In that role, she had free reign to look into the current state of race equality in Scotland. And my ask of her was to scope out the landscape and report back to me on how we might really make a difference. And in her report addressing race inequality in Scotland, The Way Forward, published on Monday, Ms Lyle has identified a number of key areas where she believes we can make a positive impact on the lives of individuals from minority ethnic backgrounds, and I agree with her assessment. I'm very pleased that Ms Lyle is with us today, uh, observing proceedings uh, from the public gallery, and I would like to put on record my appreciation for the work that she has carried out. As a, a result of her thorough and nuanced analysis, we now have a clear steer as to where we ought to concentrate our efforts during this parliamentary session. The Race Equality Action Plan, also published on Monday, is our response uh, to her challenge. This new action plan does not negate the work uh, currently underway by a wide range of stakeholders uh, in this sector. There is a lot of good work in progress which will continue to receive our support. Rather, this new plan augments that work and seeks to build on the solid foundations which have been laid by organisations such as Bemis, SEMFO and CREAR. But it is the time now for specific, concrete actions which will effect change now. And in her report, Ms Lyle identified a number of key areas of priority and I would like to touch on some of these uh, just briefly. Everyone in society should have equality of opportunity when it comes to earning a living or pursuing their preferred career. Yet for many people from our minority ethnic communities, achieving this ambition remains elusive. And frustratingly, despite having the highest level of educational attainment, people from minority ethnic communities are twice as likely to be unemployed compared to those from white communities. And we need to understand why this is and take action to address it. And in our new Race Equality Action Plan, we set out a series of actions uh, to do just that. And we will review current employment support measures to ensure that they are focused on achieving parity in employment. And we will also work with organisations right across the public sector to increase employment and progression uh, for people from minority ethnic backgrounds also. Last year, presiding officer, the Scottish Government provided £60,000 to the Grameen Foundation. Uh, since it began lending in Scotland in 2014, this foundation has provided over £600,000 in loans, with 56% of recipients being women and 71% of recipients from, uh, being from minority ethnic communities. So today, uh, I am delighted to announce that we will be providing a further £70,000 to strengthen their existing activity and to support their expansion into new communities in Dundee and uh, North Ayrshire, helping over 100 new entrepreneurs uh, to access affordable microcredit. And addressing these employment issues will not yield results overnight, but it is right that we prioritise this area for decisive action, 
given the significant uh, lasting and transformative impact uh, that it will have. Now, turning to housing, statistics show that people from minority ethnic communities are four times more likely to live in overcrowded homes uh, than their white counterparts. And they are also far more likely to live in housing in the private sector, often in poorer quality housing stock. And it is of fundamental importance uh, that everyone has a safe and secure place to live and to thrive. And amongst a number of actions, we will reaffirm our expectation that local authorities fully consider the requirement for larger accommodation, including for minority ethnic families, and seek to address uh, any identified need. And we will ensure that the Joint Housing Policy and Delivery Group has a, a renewed focus uh, on the needs of minority ethnic communities. Sliding officer, when people are forced into lower paid work or face uh, continued spells of unemployment, this is a drain uh, on the economy, but it's also a waste of potential and it can seem impossible to escape the poverty trap. And tackling these issues, it will be a key consideration for our Poverty and Inequality Commission. But there are actions that we can take now to address the needs uh, of our minority ethnic communities. And in our action plan, we are committed to introducing the new financial health check service for families who have children or who are expecting. And we will ensure that ethnicity is a consideration in the development of the child poverty delivery plan. And we will work with minority ethnic volunteers on experience panels to help shape uh, our new social security system. Now, with the exception of Gypsy Traveller children, minority ethnic pupils in Scotland uh, achieve higher levels of educational attainment. But there are a number of areas that need to be addressed. Anecdotal evidence tells us that some teachers uh, lack the skills and the support structures uh, to uh, support and promote uh, anti-racist education. And in addition, uh, the diversity uh, of the teaching profession has contracted. And teachers from a minority ethnic background now only account for 1.3% uh, of the total. We'll also fund a, a series of seminars for leaders of Scottish education services to develop their knowledge and capacity to lead, to manage and to deliver for race equality. Additionally, we will work with Education Scotland and the regional improvement collaboratives uh, in the development of our new professional learning and leadership and ensure that minority ethnic teachers are encouraged and supported to participate. Over 2018, we'll also introduce a new approach for local authorities and schools to record and monitor specific information on bullying and prejudice-based bullying incidents. Now, President Officer, I want to uh, turn to gypsy travellers. We know that our gypsy traveller communities are among the most disenfranchised and discriminated against in Scotland. And at this point, I would very much like to acknowledge the work of the Equality and Human Rights Committee and indeed its predecessors uh, for the unstinting championing uh, of the rights of those communities. In order to address these complex issues, we need a more focused and a more coordinated approach right across government. And that's why I have established a ministerial uh, working group to drive change and focus efforts to improve the lives of the most marginalised people uh, in our society. And I will chair the group uh, and we'll start work uh, in the new year. President officer, I know that I have only highlighted uh, some of the key points from the action plan, which I'm sure uh, that members have noted. But I very much hope that by working together, uh, that we can collectively seize the opportunity provided by the Independent Race Equality Advisors Report and continue uh, to make changes for the better in the lives uh, of our minority ethnic communities. Uh, and I'm very pleased to move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Annie Wells to speak to and move Amendment 9529.1. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. According to the 2011 Census, the size of the black and minority ethnic population in Scotland was just over 200,000, equating to 4% of the total population of Scotland. If we include all minority ethnic populations, including those who do not identify as white, Scottish or British, this figure is even higher, at 8%, equating to around one in every 12 people. Significant as this is, those from the ethnic minority population still face cultural and economic barriers that prevent them from reaching their potential, simply because of their ethnicity. People from minority ethnic groups are more likely to be in poverty and live in overcrowded homes compared with those from the white, Scottish and British population. They have lower employment rates, 
something that I will expand on later. And when it comes to public life, people from minority ethnic populations are still vastly underrepresented. In this year's Scottish Council elections, for example, just 15 non-white minority ethnic councillors were elected out of a total of 1,227. And this is a percentage of just 1.2%. We know there is still a long way to go in ensuring true racial equality, which is why I welcome the debate today and we will be supporting the government's motion. I am pleased that action has been taken through the publication of the Racial Equality Action Plan, as well as the creation of the Ministerial Working Group on Gypsy Travellers and Travellers, and see this as an opportunity to speak honestly about the challenges that lie ahead, as well as the frustrating pace at which certain areas are progressing. In continually identifying the barriers that exist as, as to prioritise resources, it's important that we continually seek to improve the data that's available to us, something the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights has raised with the Equality and Human Rights Committee. And whilst the Equality Evidence Strategy outlined the general approach to strengthening the evidence base, as Claire points out, it remains important that we seek to specify and define individual projects to fill the gaps. Some of the most important gaps it identifies are those in, in data from public sector bodies ethnicity pay gap data, social security take up, statistics on positive action schemes, racist incidents in school, career guidance data, and intersectional analysis on poverty, ethnicity, and gender. I would like to see the Scottish Government create a strong plan as to how this data will be gathered with accompanying timescales, something that my amendment alludes to. In doing so, we will ensure that resources are prioritized where they are needed and accurate data is recorded so that we can, we can see what needs to be done and in what specific areas. Where we know there are vast disparities, as we have seen with employment, often seen as out of poverty, I would like to see concerted efforts being made to bridge the gap between white Scots and ethnic minority groups. We know that ethnic minorities outperform in education compared to white Scots, but when it comes to the labour market, things drastically change. BME people are often clustered into lower grade part-time jobs and while Scots have employment rates of 74.2%, this figure plummets to 58.5% for ethnic minority groups. Discrimination still exists in both the private and public sector. A career study evidenced that for local authority jobs, even after the interview stage, white candidates were almost twice as likely to be appointed as BME candidates. And a 2009 DWP study found that despite submitting the same application, people with a BME name had to submit 16 job applications, compared with nine for those with a white name before response. Um, and that is, that, that's still unacceptable. And as we heard from the 16-year-old Charlotte at the Equality and Human Rights Committee last week, as a gypsy traveler, she felt compelled to hide her ethnicity when starting work at a nursery. And more, evident, more evidently needs to be done, and I am pleased that the plan sets out actions on this. And a final point I would like to make today is about the importance of being as proactive as we possibly can when it comes to improving the lives of Scotland's minority populations. During meetings where I have sought to learn about promoting diversity in public life more broadly, the need to go into communities directly has been brought up time and time again. When I met with Inspector Shakur of Police Scotland, who specialised in encouraging members of minority groups to consider a career with force, I was truly inspired to hear about his efforts in breaking boundaries and speaking to everyone in the community, whether that be faith leaders, parents, as well as potential new recruits. I was inspired by the passion of Inspector Shakur, who really showed me that to encourage diversity in employment and public representation, it's about getting into these communities and showing that you care. To conclude today, I would like once again to thank the Scottish Government for bringing this issue forward to reinstate the Parliament's efforts in bringing full racial equality. It is important to have an honest debate around this subject and talk openly about what we can do to achieve the aims set out in the motion and amendments. There has been some progress made in recent years, but on a number of fronts we still need to see progress stagnating. And this is something I hope that more focused action can bring about improvement on. I move the amendment in my name.
Thank you very much. I call Polly McNeill to speak to move amendment 9529.3. Ms McNeill, five minutes, please. Fifty years after the introduction of Britain's first legislation aimed at tackling inequality for minority ethnic people, they still face serious disadvantages in their daily lives. Higher rates of poverty, as we've heard, lower rates of employment and a range of health inequalities dominate the picture. What's more, the lack of minority ethnic visibility in every aspect of public life is shocking and is a testament to the failures of public policy and successive governments. When it comes to political life, as Annie Wells has already said, it's shocking to find there were actually two councillors down from the previous local election. And in fact, based on that 4% of the minority ethnic community, there should in fact be 49 minority ethnic councillors in Scotland to reflect the population. And sadly, we only have three female councillors who are minority ethnic. Similarly, only 1% of Police Scotland officers are staff from a minority ethnic background. There is something seriously wrong here. And there has to be something in the action plan that means something to get that figure up. Despite the reality, the action on race and equality has fallen off the agenda. The government's framework for race equality is long overdue. The debate is long overdue in this parliament. And I have to express a frustration that the debate is reduced to an hour and a half slot. I think I would have preferred to have delayed the debate so we could have had longer to debate it. But of course, I recognise the I framework just, Can itself. I just remind the member, it's the Bureau that decides, and that's represented by business managers across all the parties who agree the timings. I, I, I was just expressing my personal view that given the importance of the But I think in fairness it, to say this is agreed across the chamber by the business managers. Yeah, well, I still stand by what I've said, which is I would have preferred that the debate was, was, was delayed because I just think it's such an important debate for the parliament. The framework itself is a very positive thing, but if I'm honest, the document really needs to try and set out a, a clearer vision. And I know that the government tried to do that in the action plan. But I agree what appears to be missing from this approach is any serious monitoring of what progress we might make along the way. And the Labour Amendment tries to address this. We will also be supporting the Tory Amendment this evening. But one aspect that can be lost in this debate is how diverse the problem is itself. And the fact that the minority ethnic population is around 4%, that tells us very, very little about the problem. Organisations such as Bemis would argue that that figure is higher if you include the Polish and Irish communities and those from the AA countries such as Romania and Bulgaria. African and Polish communities are much more likely to be in low paid jobs, whilst minority ethnic women are doubly disadvantaged. Um, gypsy travellers included in the definition under the Act are a very small group, and as the Cabinet Secretary has, says, has said already, they face extremely high levels of discrimination when compared with other groups, and I welcome her announcement today. It is essential that different aspects of the needs of each community are analysed and that it is not simply seen as a hierarchical problem in nature. The minority ethnic people are twice as likely to be in poverty. Indeed, one third are in poverty after housing costs compared to 18% of non-minority ethnic communities. And they have a lower rate of benefit take-up. Racism and disadvantage is deep-rooted. It is the cycle of hidden or unconscious bias in all levels of society that need to be seriously challenged if we are to make progress. Scotland is not that different from the rest of the UK when it comes to institutionalised racism. Women and girls is one of the areas I would like to ask for deeper, deeper analysis. There is a lack of disaggregated data and the Scottish economy, as we know, is highly segregated. And ethnic minority women are underrepresented in lead sectors of the knowledge economy, including, including science. 39% of Pakistani women are in the wholesale retail sector. 46% of Chinese women are concentrated in the hotel sector. Girls have a higher level of attainment than boys in BME groups. And that, in fact, they have a higher level of attainment amongst all groups. So we need to have a very, very serious look to see how we can make that matter to, to those groups of girls. Close the Gap noted that there is a concentration of women in low paid professions and that they are significantly underrepresented in senior roles. In closing, presiding officer, minority ethnic women 
experience a double barrier of racism and sexism. And it makes it difficult to find work which matches their qualifications, despite, as I said earlier, achieving their higher qualifications. I recognise that the work the government are doing, the Labour, uh, Labour benches will be supporting the government motion today, and of course, as I said, the Tory motion. We need to start making real progress in this area, and I hope we're going to start very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't think you moved your amendment. Presenting officer, apologies for that, and I move the Labour amendment in Thank my you. name. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate, speeches of four minutes, please. And can I remind members, if you have not pressed your request to speak button, it follows you have not requested to speak, Mr Dornan. Uh, I call Claire Hockey, followed by Graham Simpson. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's debate, and indeed the publication of the Race Equality Action Plan, sends a strong message to those from ethnic minority backgrounds that the Scottish Government is resolute in making our country a better and fairer place, no matter your background or race. <coughs> the strategy sets out many positive steps that will be taken over the coming years to drive real and lasting change, and it will strive to ensure that all are able to realise their true potential. It's a plan that contains no less than 120 different actions from employment to education, health to housing and poverty to public representation, showing the Scottish Government's clear commitment in improving every aspect of a person's life. We've come a long way over the last few decades in reducing racial inequalities. However, it's dis a disappointing reality that those from underrepresented backgrounds still face poorer outcomes than the majority of Scots. For example, in the year ending June 2017, the employment rate in Scotland for white people was 74%. However, for ethnic minority groups, the employment rate is much lower at 58%. Stats also show that while one in five people defined as white British live in poverty, over one in three from minority backgrounds do so. People from such communities are twice as likely to be unemployed, and if we tackle the inequalities and discrimination within the labour market, then many other linked inequalities can be alleviated too. Our aspiration is not simply to move those marginalised into employment, it's to ensure they are employed in jobs which are appropriate for their level of skills, qualifications and their experience. One of the most marginalised groups in Scotland currently is the Gypsy Traveller community, as we've heard. The most recent Scottish Social Attitudes survey found that 34% of people in Scotland believed gypsy travellers were unsuitable to be a primary school teacher, whilst 31% would be unhappy if a relative married a gypsy traveller. Just for one moment, presiding officer, let us reflect on those findings. If this was any other community, there would be a social outcry and those holding such views would be taken to task. Such attitudes aren't easily changed when a former Tory MSP, now an MP, voiced similar views himself. When asked if he were Prime Minister for the day and if there were no repercussions, then what would he do? And Douglas Ross responded that he would like to see tougher enforcement against gypsy travellers. The gypsy traveller community are a huge part of Scotland's rich cultural heritage and Mr Ross should be ashamed by the way he singled out the group. The discrimination against them sadly seems accepted and normalised by many and therefore I welcome the commitments made by this report to tackle this. In addition to financially supporting organisations who work to improve outcomes for gypsy travellers, the Scottish Government will also, as we've heard, establish a ministerial working group specifically to drive forward improvements for this community. Such steps show the Scottish Government's leadership in advancing race equality. Presiding officer, my constituency of Rutherglen is home to Scotland's second largest settlement of show people. Show people for centuries have toured the country, providing entertainment and other services to local communities, taking pride in their strong, unique cultural identity. Now, I doubt there is a member here in the chamber who doesn't have a childhood or even a more recent memory of a trip to the shows. From the constituents I have spoken with, and indeed from the discussions we've had in the Showman's Guild cross-party group, many of this community would wish to be able to identify themselves as distinct peoples. The option to identify oneself as white gypsy traveller was included for the first time in the Scottish 2011 census. And this is a step which I welcome. However, many show people also wish their community to be granted equal status and acknowledgement in any further census. Presiding officer, despite, uh, thank you. Thank, uh, presiding officer, 
they, they show people that identity can often be misunderstood and therefore any steps to increase their uh, knowledge of theirs and different minorities and cultures should be welcomed. Thank you very much. I call Graham Simpson to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Simpson, please. Thank you. Um, can I also welcome this debate, but can I agree uh, with Pauline McNeill that it is a shame that it's been shoehorned into the end of the afternoon. As Annie Wells said, we'll be supporting the government's motion. Uh, you don't really need to say any more than the first few words of that motion, that no one should be marginalised or discriminated against because of their race or background. Kalyanna Lyles addressing race inequality in Scotland the way forward is an important document. It's a useful and detailed outline of some of the key challenges. Uh, can I also welcome the Race Equality Action Plan in which the Cabinet Secretary states, quotes, the reality is that in Scotland today, people from minority ethnic communities are twice as likely to be unemployed, run a higher risk of poverty, and are more likely to live in overcrowded homes. It's housing that I want to concentrate my remarks on today. First, some statistics taken from both reports. In Scotland, white, other British, Pakistani and white Scottish e ethnic groups had the highest levels of home ownership, 70, 68 and 68 percent respectively in 2011. The African and white gypsy traveller groups had the highest proportions of people who lived in social rented accommodation 41 and 40 percent. This was double the rate in the population as a whole. White Polish, Bangladeshi and African households had the highest rates of overcrowding. And Ms. Lyle says that people from minority ethnic communities are disproportionately likely to live in the private rented sector but that we know little as to why this is the case and she recommends that research is done to explore the gap between what minority ethnic communities need, what they have and why. Accurate data is important, as our amendment points out. Ms Lyle also suggests that the Scottish Government should consider setting aside a proportion of the Affordable Housing Investment Fund to allow for the provision of larger properties for minority ethnic communities in those local authority areas, areas which are failing to do this. Now, Ms Constance does not go quite as far as this in her own series of action points, and I think she's probably right in the tone she sets. We need to treat everybody in housing uh, need fairly based on accurate data. Ms Lyle also addresses the crucial area of housing quality and focuses on the private rented sector. She says, we have the legislation required to target housing quality improvement in those sectors where minority ethnic communities predominate. What is now needed is better enforcement of that legislation. And she calls for the Scottish Government to do an assessment of the enforcement of private rented sector regulations and report on the findings. As members across this chamber have said uh, previously, housing conditions and maintenance is a huge issue. We should not limit our discussion on this to particular sections of society or indeed particular forms of tenure. The issue is massive and needs to be seen as such, although it's clearly a particular issue for certain sections of society. Deputy Presiding Officer, I said at the start, I welcome the Race Equality Action Plan. However, like most government documents, it is heavy on waffle, particularly the housing section, and light on detail. Uh, but that aside, uh, if we back this motion, then we can truly have a chance uh, of achieving race equality. Uh, thank you. And I also hear what the member had to say about the length of the debate. Can I suggest that Graeme Simpson and indeed Polly McNeill take this up with the respective business managers? Because that's the only way these arrangements come about for timings. If you're not happy, take it up with them so that they don't have this happen next time. That's not a point of order, Ms McNeill. That's a, not a point of order. Point of order? Um, since you intervened in my speech twice to, to say that, I just wanted to know if any rules had been broken. By I, hear the, I hear what the presiding officer saying that we should raise it, but you I think it's a point of clarification for the Chamber. I hear parties are unhappy about the length of time this debate, 
The res resolution for this is to speak to your business managers who agree the timings for all the debates in this chamber. And that's an issue for all parties here. Every party in here has their business manager represented at the bureau meeting who decides the timings for debates. It was for clarification for the chamber about why this is a short debate. I now call Fulton McGregor followed by Anna Sarwar. No, sir. I, whole, I agree wholeheartedly with the motion uh, and that Scotland should be a country that is proud of its record of striving for equality. We should continue to endeavour to be a country that nurtures good relations within communities, supports interfaith activities and tackles the prejudices and attitudes that foster intolerance and hate crime. Scotland should be a place where individuals from a variety of backgrounds can live and raise their families safely and without fear of prejudice. And furthermore, people of all faiths and ethnic backgrounds should be able to follow their religion or beliefs without bigotry or bias from others. The race equality framework for Scotland shows a real commitment from this government to tackling the barriers faced in achieving race equality and in tackling racism and addressing the obstacles that prevent people from minority ethnic communities from realising their potential. In terms of employment barriers, I believe that private companies should report not just on their gender pay gap, but on gender, race and disability. We should be ensuring that the Scottish living wage is paid across all sectors, particularly in those where a significant numbers of workers from BME backgrounds are present. Many such citizens are the most economically active, but as others have said, are residing, in, are residing disproportionately in poverty. But it's even getting into work in the first place, presiding officer. Someone who's spoken to me um, as a, a constituency case from Iran has got a degree in interior architecture and design and a Master's in Construction Management, yet she is experiencing significant barriers getting into that line of work. Why? Is it because she's female? Is it because she's from a BMA background? I'm not sure, but th that is something that we need to address. I also believe that modern apprenticeship programmes should continue to ensure it is putting measures in place to achieve uh, equality objectives by continuing perhaps broadening the strategic intervention across both marketing and integration to the world of work. I would also like to take this opportunity to highlight that I am the convener of the cross-party group in racial equality, taking over from my predecessor, Bob Doris, and I'd like to thank the vast array of organisations, far too many to mention, that make up this group and contribute, but particularly the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, and in particular Yatin, Rebecca and Carol. Who, who make sure that the cross-party group functions well. The group aims to provide a forum for issues relating to race and anti-racism and to seek solutions to discrimination faced by Scotland's black, minority and ethnic, ethnic communities. And, as a wee plug, the next meeting is the 23rd of January eh, and I would encourage all MSPs that have contributed to today's debate and wider to come along. And, for, and, and while I'm on that issue, actually, for the next eh, cross-party group meeting, there is actually an invite that's just been um, put into the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, and Kalini Lyle, so um, hopefully their diaries will permit them to come along and, and discuss the, the framework. But of course, some of the speakers that we've had at previous meetings has included Miss Lyle. Um, she came and done an, an excellent presentation while forming the, um, the, the, the debate that we're here today about. Um, but what I do think is fair in my position as convener, it's only fair that I highlight the overall feeling in the room by members, which I think can be put into some broad areas. One, that Scotland has improved eh, over time. Um, however, that progress is very slow. People from BME communities in particular still feel the strain of prejudice in a wide range of areas, including welfare, justice and education systems. Um, for example, there is a disconnect between individual diverse communities. That's come up quite a lot through the cross-party group. And that, they, and that these communities don't want lip service and talking shops. They want elected members, parliamentarians and others to take their thoughts and views seriously. And I think that that's what this framework brought forward by this government and this cabinet secretary does. Another area that, well, I can actually see I'm throwing out time. I was going to speak about the gypsy traveller community that we spoke about in the group as well, but I know that my colleague Claire Hockey has eloquently covered that. Um, I think in summary, presiding officer, to close up, uh, one of the most important actions is for a zero tolerance approach to discrimination to be employed. It just doesn't go for the general public, but for employers, healthcare providers, planning bodies, and a range of people uh, across the public sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. I call Anna Sarwar to be followed by John Finney. Mr Sarwar, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I be clear that my comments today uh, are not a criticism of the, of the Minister, uh, or indeed of the good intentions of the civil servants, or indeed of the action plan. Uh, I, I welcome the action plan. I welcome the points in the action plan. 
Uh, but I want to reflect on uh, my own lived experience uh, and stories that are shared with me by family, friends and also constituents. Uh, because while I think the aims uh, in the plan are noble, I think there is a wider institutional problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, let's take this parliament as an example. We've had five parliamentary elections and in that time we have only elected four different ethnic minority members to this chamber. All from Glasgow, all from South Asian background, all Muslim and all male. In the entire history of the Westminster Parliament, we have only ever elected three ethnic minority members to Westminster. You might say two from the same family perhaps negates some of it. But actually, as it stands, we have zero representation of ethnic minorities from Scotland in the UK Parliament. And anyone that is from an ethnic minority that has represented any political party, either in this chamber or in Westminster, will tell you that we are actually nervous when it comes to talking about race. Because part of it is a belief that we need to express ourselves as being representatives of all communities, not just the community that we ourselves come from. And that's why actually we avoid talking about race. I can be honest, I'm actually nervous talking about race today in this parliament. And as people know, I don't often get nervous about many things. But what I do want to speak about is what I think is at times a Scottish exceptionalism. I don't think we as a country or a society actually talk about race the way we should. I don't think our chattering classes talk about race. I don't think the media talks about race. We rightly all repeat the line that Scotland is an open diverse and inclusive country but that shouldn't blind us to the challenges that are in Scotland as well and it sometimes feels as if we talk ourselves up as being different and better than other places when in actual fact there is good and bad in every country you don't become any more or less a racist when you go past a border just past Carlisle we have good and bad in all our countries and the other difficulty is when ethnic minority people do talk about race because it's not talked about in wider society, because it's not talked about in our wider country, because it's not talked about in our media, we often get accused of playing the race card when we do. And I welcome and I celebrate and I join in all those campaigns around everyday sexism, very important, around everyday homophobia. What about the discussions about everyday racism that takes place? We've all heard it. I'm not a racist, but. I know you say you're Scottish, but one of my personal favourites. I can't be a racist. I have black friends. Or as someone said to me just a few weeks ago, this is particularly worrying, I can't be racist. I teach black children. The reality is, yes, we have seen reduction in racial hate crimes in our communities, but we've seen an increase in religious hate crimes instead, often transferring that hatred onto a different form of different. Islamophobic hate crimes have doubled in the last year in Scotland. And that's impacting particularly on women, and particularly women that wear a headscarf. I don't have time, but I would go into more detail out of some of the examples about challenges that we face around Police Scotland. We've already heard the statistics, so I'm not going to cover the statistics again. But what we need to measure and address is the actual wider institutional issues that we face. Not just action, but how we actually change and challenge a different culture. Not just talking about the proportion in the wider workforce that represent the BME, but actually examining the proportion that are representative in lead roles too. Now, I have experience in the last three months eh, of a certain campaign. I'm not going to go into the details of that today. At some point, perhaps in the future, eh, when I think I'm more confident to do so, I may speak about some of it. But the question that does need to be asked is how many CEOs of companies in Scotland are ethnic minorities? How many chairs of public bodies in Scotland are ethnic minorities? How many chief executives of councils or government departments in Scotland are ethnic minorities? How many departmental directors are ethnic minorities? How many special advisors are ethnic minorities? How many staff that run political parties are ethnic minorities? How many university or college principals are ethnic minorities? How many school head teachers are ethnic minorities? How many editors or producers are ethnic minorities in Scotland? The answer to each and every single one of them is either none or next to none. That is not acceptable and that needs to be addressed in our wider society. I want to say a lot more. Now is not the time, perhaps at some point in the future. Uh, thank Deputy you. Officer. I appreciate that. That's why I like you have longer uh, in that particular uh, uh, speech. 
John Finney to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, indeed, uh, President Officer, and I, I very much welcome this debate. And uh, the, the comments have been alluded to earlier. No one should be marginalised or discriminated against. Now, um, I proposed an amendment to this, and the amendment was um, to insert recognises the failure of successive governments to eradicate long-standing and deep-seated prejudice against gypsy travellers. Now, I have a lot of engagement with the gypsy traveller community. Most of them call themselves Scottish travellers, and I, I think it would be churlish not to say there's been a lot of progress uh, in this, and, and I welcome the leadership that the Cabinet Secretary has taken on this. I don't think we can look forward without always looking back, and I want to allude to documents that were made available um, to the Equal Opportunities, who's held a briefing the other morning there, and it was about the historic situation gypsy travellers found themselves in. This was a housing experiment. It's a housing experiment, and, and I'm very grateful as ever to Rosanna and Seamus McPhee. Not that I should need to say this, both very highly educated and talented people, both unemployed um, and gypsy travellers. And I'm just going to read a couple of passages from this letter, if I may, uh, President Officer. And this is a letter on the 19th of March, 1954. And it says, after working among this class of people for the past 17 years, I fully appreciate the general opinion that the majority of the nomad families have not many redeeming features. Nevertheless, if we are to tolerate such a way of life in our midst, then we must provide suitable camping sites for this class of people. Further on, this property is 12 miles from Bear Glowry, and I would suggest it would be ideal for a tinker settlement, which I can, only, I can see is the only solution to the tinker problem. I'm sure this proposed small tinker settlement would at least be part of the solution to this grievous problem in our midst and would uh, be an example to other counties as to how to tackle the tinker problem. And this was written to the county clerk. And if I tell you, it was written by a gentleman who signs himself William Webb, chaplain to the tinkers. Um, that tells you all you need to know about the standing. And so I, I would say in relation to that, no one should be marginalised and discriminated against. How do our uh, gypsy traveller communities feel about that at the moment? Um, in a briefing that was prepared for the, the recent session of the Equal Opportunities uh, Committee, uh, which I, I was previously a member in the last session, it alluded to two of the reports that have taken place, Gypsy Travellers in Care and uh, Where Gypsy Travellers Live. And we heard stories, and it's not unique to, to the Gypsy Traveller community, about um, medical practitioners refusing to treat Gypsy Travellers, Gypsy Travellers being turned away from accident and emergency, and we know um, that there's limited information, so we do support the Conservative uh, position about data, um, but there's limited information. If you know the, the, the Irish traveller movement has ga gathered a lot of information, I would commend the yellow flag um, system, indeed I have commended to the Scottish Government in the past, um, which talks about, if only I could find my note, they talk about uh, encouraging an environment of interculturalism. Um, because um, these are still different people. These are the folk that part their their uh, trailers in lay-bys beside main roads. Why do they do that? They don't choose to, to park there. They don't choose to go in industrial estates. They no longer have access to their historic stopover sites. Local authorities have a mixed position in this, I have to say, um, and uh, local authorities have obligations uh, to assess housing need. I've had challenges with that in my own area. Highland Council has four sites. Um, one of the sites uh, suffered a, a lot of damage. I raised this with them when they were uh, going to sort it. They said there was no need. There was no, there was no need. And I said, how did you establish the need? Well, we'll cut a long story short. It's all been sorted. And when I passed on Friday night, um, the site was full, full of families. And that's, that's good to see. What I would say is the political leadership that all these reports have called for is absolutely needed. Now, I get that no one wants a bun fight over whose responsibility is planning a, a, a matter that's reserved to local authorities. But someone has to grasp this because we all need to live somewhere and we all need to have access. And if your lifestyle uh, is genuinely going to be facilitated, and there's no reason that a nomadic lifestyle cannot be supported in this day and age, then this will require people to either cede power or seize power. But either way, we, we need that change. Now, um, it also requires political leadership. And, and whilst we're happy to support the Conservative Party tonight, it does need political leadership. Douglas Ross has been alluded to. You know, there's not many of us we get the opportunity to say, if you have charge of things for the day, what would you do? That wasn't a spontaneous outburst. There was something deep-seated there, and that was a history of involvement with planning issues and, and, uh, and uh, in uh, Murray, indeed. So, um, also this week I read, and you'll excuse my language, that um, the Conservative Party have uh, 
had the, restored the whip to the MP Anne Marie Morris, who apparently used the N word. Um, now, you know, we need leadership. We had an excellent speech from Anne Sarver there. We need to change things. You'll get full back in Cabinet Secretary for the, 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 the plans you have here if we can deliver on them. Please. Thank you. Call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Gail Ross. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too welcome today's debate and I very much thank the Scottish Government for using their time to allow the Parliament the opportunity to consider the Race Equality Action Plan published this week. All told, the 120 action points recommended by the plan represent the distance that we as a nation still have to travel in respect of our efforts to eradicate racial inequality and discrimination in this country. Now, I have quoted the words of Coretta Scott King in this chamber before when she said that the struggle for equality is never truly over. You have to win it with each and every generation. Deputy Presiding Officer, when the President of the United States, the putative leader of the free world, takes it upon himself to retweet the vile, fabricated and hate-filled videos of Britain first, designed to incite hatred against Islam, then that should serve as a weather vane for where our generation's struggle shall lie. Now, this action plan gives us both the measure of the task before us in Scotland and in the main presents a roadmap of how to get there. It speaks to a range of frontiers that we need to collectively make progress on. Now, the calamitous decision to exit the EU has emboldened the far right in this country and has led to an uptick in religious intolerance and in hate, race hate crimes. And uh, whilst that has predominantly been manifest south of the border, we do our communities a disservice if we believe that this increase has only been manifest in England. So I welcome the plan and pledge the support of these benches in its execution. But we do well to uh, listen to organisations like the Commission for Racial Equality who point out the gaps in the plan and in our existing provision for uh, people from ethnic minorities, particularly in areas such as mental health. As such, it's important that this plan remains a living, breathing document uh, open to continuous improvement from all quarters. But in the time I have left to me, I want to pick up the words of John Finney uh, and address, indeed, the particular aspects of the government motion, which aren't necessarily fully addressed in the plan itself, in respect of gypsy travellers, because we often forget that they too are afforded protections in the Equalities Act under the protected characteristic of race and ethnicity. As Vice Convener of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, it was my privilege to take evidence last week from a range of uh, representatives from the Scottish Gypsy Traveller community, and John Finney uh, was very welcome to join us on that occasion. And I am not overstating things, Deputy Presiding Officer, when I say it amounted to two of the most informative hours of my career in this place that gypsies and travellers can trace their origins in Scotland to before the time of the Vikings, gives them an indigenous status here that's nearly unparalleled, but yet they still experience what amounts to, in the world, words of Davy Donaldson, who, is, who was their fiercely articulate representative at the meeting, the last acceptable form of racism in this country. Davy is 19 and as a nomadic traveller has seen the rights and interests of his people and other communities of gypsies and travellers in this community steadily eroded over that short period of time. He's currently studying for an undergraduate degree in social anthropology at the University of Aberdeen. But prior to that, he held a sort of youth council representative role. And on one occasion, he attended a meeting around planning in the city. And, was, and he asked about the needs of the traveller community. Not knowing that he himself was a traveller, the senior city figure chairing that meeting replied to him by saying, and I quote, son, the first rule of, in planning you need to understand is that nobody cares about the tinks. That was just two years ago. It's almost unimaginable that a city leader would use such a pejorative or derisory term about any other race or ethnicity. Yet this attitude is manifest in the number of sites that have been closed to travellers in the last two decades, and we've heard something of that this afternoon. The open abuse and name-calling, the normalisation of name-calling that they're subjected to in schools and communities, and in the prejudice that they still experience in trying to obtain full-time employment. It struck me that while our society is, to my mind, very much enriched by these communities, we persistently fail them in the formulation of public 
policy. And the Cabinet Secretary, in her opening remarks, talked of the disenfranchisement of uh, that community. And I, I would ask this chamber, if you're nomadic in Scotland, for example, who represents your interests in this place? Who is your MSP? Who do you go to for support? These are issues I look forward to addressing as we deliver the action plan. So I thank the government again for raising this important issue today and once again ensure them of our support for their motion and both of the amendments before us tonight. Thank you. Gail Ross, followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to welcome the publication of the Race Equality Plan and, as many of the speakers before me have said, in particular the focus on the inequality and discrimination experienced by gypsy travellers. Presently in Scotland, gypsy travellers experience particular disadvantage in many areas which are not only limited to housing, health, employment and education. And it is saddening and frustrating to see how many of the problems they experience are cyclical in nature. As reported by Shelter Scotland, there are currently no official transit sites where travellers can stop over, while many council-run sites are situated in bad locations and have inadequate facilities and limited access to services. This means, as John Finney has already said, that they often have to stop in unauthorised areas, which leads to problems and confrontation with local communities, making the initial problem harder to resolve. It is encouraging to see the action already taken and the progress made here in Scotland, the recognition of gypsy travellers as an ethnic minority, recognising their individual <coughs> culture, traditions and ethnicity, as well as ensuring they are receiving the equality law protection that they are entitled to due to this protected characteristic. The guidance published to local authorities in May this year, the establishment of the Scottish Traveller Education Review Group, and the incorporation of minimum site standards into the Scottish Social Housing Charter. That being said, it must be pointed out that so much of the work carried out on the Gypsy Traveller strategy was subject to numerous delays and this must be avoided in the future. President Officer, we still have a long way to go in this area and we must tackle the false and damaging prejudice that exists around Gypsy Travellers. And it must be shown that common and insidious assumptions about this group of people cannot and must not be tolerated. I would like to invite those in the chamber to imagine themselves in this position. You notice that your son's homework is repeatedly not being marked by his teacher, so you express your concerns. As you leave the school, you hear the same teacher at the gate say, I don't know why she's complaining. I know he's a gypsy. He's not going to do anything with it anyway. And Alec Cole Hamilton told this story, but I'm going to tell it again because it's worthwhile repeating it. That young boy grows up. He's at a community planning executive meeting as vice chair of the local youth council. He's 16. It was his first time there and nobody knew he was a traveller. They were discussing national health service provision in rural and marginalised communities. So he decides to ask a question. What about the gypsy traveller community? The whole table went silent and then the line, here son, here's your first lesson. No one cares about the tanks. And these are just two examples that were relayed to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee last week. It's still happening and in some sectors it's getting worse. Lack of access to health care, education, social services, jobs, sometimes even sanitary services and running water. It is acknowledged in the report that discrimination against gypsy travellers is far more accepted and normalised than that directed at other minority ethnic groups. And those giving evidence last week told us that the treatment they face is the last acceptable form of racism. Absolutely. Mary Fee. Thank you. Um, I'm grateful to the member for, for taking the, the intervention. I absolutely agree with the comment that Gail Ross has just made and others have made about the, the discrimination that, 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 that gypsy travellers um, face. And, and many members in the chamber will know that I have a particular interest in the plight of, of gypsy travellers. This chamber has a strong record when it works together to tackle discrimination and to tackle inequality. So does the member agree it's now time for this whole chamber to unite to tackle the discrimination that gypsy travellers face? Quickly, please, Ms Ross. I couldn't agree more. Well said, thank you. The Scottish Government prides itself on its inclusive values 
and has repeatedly acted in demonstrating this, such as the reassurance offered to EU nationals living in Scotland after Brexit and our apology and pardon to gay men with historical convictions, amongst other things. So I welcome the measures in the action plan to move to achieving real, tangible progress that we can all be proud of and promote tolerance amongst everyone in our society, including and particularly towards the Gypsy Traveller community. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to be taking part in today's important debate on race equality. It is absolutely vital that Scotland should be a tolerant, welcoming society and that nobody should be discriminated against because of their race or their background. That is why it's vitally important that we engage with people and ask them to come forward and speak honestly about what is happening and the topic we're discussing today. Race inequality can affect every aspect of a person's life. People from ethnic minorities can face discrimination and challenges when attempting to secure housing, enter the workplace, or even access transport. These are basic functions that we would expect to have in a normal society. And if we are putting barriers up against individuals for that, that is totally unacceptable. It is important for us all to look at the wide range of issues affecting those of ethnic minorities when we address this issue. The introduction of a joint ministerial working group is very much welcome and recognises that these issues cannot be viewed in isolation. Race inequality cuts across ministerial portfolios and the fact must be borne that we must take, bear that in mind when we're talking about policy decisions. The new working group should help to ensure that this happens and that the tackling of race inequality is a top priority for this government and for this parliament as we go forward. Over the past few decades, Deputy Presiding Officer, we have come a long way in terms of tackling race inequality, but there is still some way to go. And recent events over recent months have been very worrying and members this afternoon have already alluded to some of these situations and circumstances that have taken place that cause us real concern. Addressing race inequality in Scotland, the way forward by the Independent Race Equality Advisor is a comprehensive publication and gives real direction to where we should be focusing our efforts, focusing our efforts on working together, focusing our efforts on making communities feel safe and focusing our efforts in supporting individuals. The Scottish Conservative Amendment today asks for members to recognise the importance of continually improving the data we have. And that's vitally important because that shows exactly what we can do if we take the information and use it to our advantage. The report cites previous examples of data collection with the Equalities of Evidence strategy and calls for the Scottish Government to act and, and tackle the, uh, uh, the gaps that we have and identify the strategy. I very much welcome the new funding that is there and it will be transforming, but we have to work together to make sure that does become a reality. Moreover, the report talks about the Scottish Government sh showing leadership across the public sector to improve the collection of ethnic data. And that, as I say, has to be looked at to ensure that we do have that. The gathering that type of data is incredibly important to both identifying and then more importantly, tackling such inequalities. I hope that all members across the chamber can support uh, our amendment today. And, and I see the opportunities that it brings. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, it has been very encouraging to hear many of the comments here in the chamber today because people understand the real issues that are being faced by some individuals in our communities. And I'm pleased to see the Scottish gov Government doing so. And the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the entirety of the Scottish Government's motion here today with our small addition. So we must do all we can. And I support uh, the amendment in Annie Wells' name. But we must focus on the action plan, making things better, improving the lives of individuals, improving the lives of groups that feel disenfranchised, that feel that they have got barriers put in front of them. So it's up to us, Deputy Presiding Officer, in this place to make a difference and working together, we can achieve that. Now move to the closing speeches. Uh, Mark Griffin, please, up to four minutes. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the debate and the publication of the Race Equality Action Plan, which now provides a framework for how we improve the lives and experiences of minority ethnic communities in Scotland. And like the Cabinet Secretary, I want to pay particular thanks to Callie Annie Lyle and the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights for their contributions to this report and the debate. 
But given that this debate follows what has been, I think, a momentous day in the Chamber, it would be frustrating if today's budget overshadows some of the important contributions that we've heard, particularly from Anna Sarwar and a range of excellent speakers about the discrimination faced by the gypsy traveller community. But the government can count on the support of the Labour members in the Chamber when it takes concrete actions to advance in racial equality, and which is precisely why we've called on the government to confirm on the record that it will review and evaluate its progress in delivering on these actions. And equally, I hope that as work progresses, the government takes actions on Miss Lyle's fifth recommendation, that directors of service review previous initiatives. That would help, help us all learn valuable lessons and build improvements into its work. Uh, for instance, why employment targets in the 2008 Scottish Government Race Equality Statement were not met. But what's clear from the report is that um, many of these actions are embedded within existing projects. That shows that the important work the government is already doing to act on its equality duties, which is to be welcomed. We look forward to the detail of how the plan will be funded and supported, and also how that work can be optimised or made to, to stand alone. I think that will be crucial. Headline statistics in the plans section on employment, housing, community cohesion and poverty isolate starkly where minority ethnic communities face the greatest disadvantage, a 15% gap in the employment rate, more insecure and overcrowded housing, 50% higher poverty while experiencing hate crimes on average 10 a day, highlighted by Annie Wells, Pauline McNeill and, and others. But with next week's stage one debate on the social security bill just around the corner, I wanted to quickly concentrate on some of the actions under section five Particularly welcome is the commitment that the experience panels will be fully representative. And when I asked earlier in the autumn, eh, monitoring work eh, hadn't begun. So I would be grateful if ministers were able to confirm if, if that's now underway. I think, President Officer, when considering racial equality alongside social security, it's alarming that minority ethnic groups are on one hand more likely to be in poverty as their white peers but yet on the other hand have a, a lower rate of benefit uptake. And we've worked with the, the government to call for a, a legal duty to increase awareness and, and uptake. And that call builds on a key recommendation of the Scottish government's poverty advisor. And one of the, the, agree, the areas that also has achieved broad agreement on the Social Security Committee is that legislation should include a right to independent advocacy. We, we back that call for all users and recognise just how important it will be. The social security system is just about to get a, a lot more complex. So for communities who already face barriers to access, if they can be aided um, by support to help them in, in any way at all, to get the most out of the, the new Scottish so, social security system, that would be most welcome. President officer, I hope that alongside our support that the government will take on board what Labour members have said about strengthening and measuring the actions uh, in the action plan and improving progress through regular reporting to Parliament and ask members to support the amendment in the name of Paul McNeill. Thank you. Paul Jamie Green, up to five minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The uh, press gallery is long since empty and the rabble and theatre of this chamber has somewhat died down. And discussing race equality doesn't really fill the newspapers the way that argy bargy over income tax does. But to the people to whom this debate matters, this debate is more important. We like to think that here in Scotland, we are a progressive and tolerant society, and in many ways we are. However, today's debate demonstrates that we cannot take our eye off the ball. As the size of the ethnic minority communities in Scotland grows, the issue <coughs> of inequality and equality becomes more and more apparent. In 2011, the uh, BME population accounted for 4% of Scotland's population, but that was six years ago. And whilst the BME population is as, as diverse uh, as any other part of society, there are distinct problems facing each community within it. As Annie Wells highlighted, uh, by identifying specific issues facing uh, specific groups, this parliament has the ability to make a real difference by prioritizing resources and targeting them at areas which need them most 
in the hope of tackling inequalities. Now, the Cabinet Secretary opened today's day, debate by pointing out some of the disparities uh, in, in the qual uh, equality in minority groups. For example, they are twice as likely to be unemployed in Scotland, despite <coughs> a high prevalence of attainment in education. And the Cabinet Secretary rightfully points out that perhaps teachers do not feel that they are adequ adequately equipped to deal with uh, and tackle some of the existential racism that students face as they pro progress from study into their careers. Uh, Pauline, Pauline McNeill pointed out uh, that uh, BMA people are twice as likely to be in poverty and have a lower rate of social security take up. And that's an interesting point. Now, there are, there's no doubt complex and often cultural reasons for this, but clearly there's still work that we can do in outreach uh, and uh, uh, increasing awareness of what support is available to people. Um, Graham Simpson raised an interesting point around housing and why accurate data is needed. And he made a point about whether or not the affordable investment fund housing will tackle the specific needs of extended families. Uh, Fulton McGregor shared uh, a story with us about how an educated and very suitably qualified uh, young lady from an uh, ethnic background struggled to find work in her field. He mentioned that if you have uh, an ethnic name on a CV or a cover letter, you have to write to twice as more employers uh, before uh, getting an interview. I find that quite shocking. So what do we do as politicians to change that when we're not in those rooms or in the heads of recruiters in the private sector? Uh, if it's quite brief. Gail Ross. Um, does he believe that um, one thing we can do as elected members is watch uh, the content of what we're saying, especially against uh, minority communities? Jamie Green. Uh, I, I, I do agree with that um, uh, in what Gil Ross is saying. I think we have a duty to call out uh, inequality, racism and all forms of homophobia where we see it in the workplace, in the streets, even in our own homes or family environments, but especially on social media as well. Um, I'd like to point out um, today uh, an outstanding uh, 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 mention to Anna Sawa, who gave us a very personal take on things. You know, we've had five parliamentary elections in Scotland and only elected four members from ethnic backgrounds. I didn't know that. Um, I didn't know that we have zero in Westminster at the moment. And I think that just shows, given the percentage of the population that I mentioned earlier, how little progress we have made in that respect. And he said that there is nervousness about talking about race in Scotland. I think therein lies the problem. Are we blinded by talking about how open-minded we think we are? We talk about sexism, we talk about homophobia, we talk about inequality on an almost daily basis in Hollywood. But do we do so at the peril of failing to discuss race? The things aren't all doom and gloom. Uh, it is good news that uh, hate crime fell 10% uh, between 2015 and 2016-17, and that is to be welcome. But perhaps in closing, I could make a plea to my fellow MSPs that working groups, reports, strategies, advisors, and so on, are always very welcome and always very positive. But what are we doing to change attitudes, to tackle stigma, to call out racism and inequality when we see it or when we hear it or when we come across it in everyday life? Saying nothing is just as bad as doing nothing, in my view. Now, I do hope we can find more time in this chamber to discuss this important issue because I want us to look back collectively, putting our political differences aside at the end of this parliamentary session and be very proud of the work that we have done collectively in delivering, delivering race equality in Scotland. Thank you. I now call Angela Constance to close this debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Constance. Thank you very much, President Officer. And I want to thank all members for their very considered uh, and thoughtful contributions to uh, the debate this afternoon. Uh, and I welcome and I'm very grateful uh, that there is a, an appetite for continued debate. Because I think it is fair to say that when you look uh, at race equality or race inequality, you could indeed legitimately have uh, a whole afternoon's debate about race equality and employment, uh, race equality and housing race equality and the planning system, uh, race equality uh, and health uh, inequalities and uh, so forth. So I very much uh, look forward to uh, further debates and indeed the invitation from the, the cross-party uh, working group from uh, Fulton McGregor as well. 
I have to say, like uh, Jamie Green, I thought Anna Sarwar's contribution uh, was excellent. Uh, and he is absolutely right. It is imperative uh, that we measure our action plans against the, the reality of lived experience, because I, for one, uh, never for a minute came into politics to produce uh, action plans uh, or government strategies. We do indeed uh, need them, but it's how they're implemented and indeed uh, how they're monitored to ensure that they are implemented uh, and that that leads to real uh, action and change uh, on the ground. And it is imperative that we encapsulate that real lived experience uh, of people from all walks of life uh, and from all backgrounds. And I also uh, concur uh, with the sentiment that's been expressed across the chamber that there's absolutely uh, no room uh, for complacency. And while race hate crime uh, has indeed reduced uh, by 10%, I think you know, there can be some legitimate concerns about whether there's been a displacement of that uh, onto uh, Islamophobic uh, or religious uh, hate crime, uh, for instance. And I was very pleased uh, you know, a month or so ago to launch that the Hate Has No Home in Scotland campaign. And a very important message in that campaign is that nobody uh, should be a bystander. Yes, indeed. Anna Sarwar. The Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention. Just on the point about Islamophobic hate crimes, she will have seen the uh, report by Tell Mama that shows that Police Scotland actually has the fourth highest rate of Islamophobic hate crimes reported uh, to it, received through freedom of information requests because it doesn't actually have at the moment a data sharing agreement with Tell Mama, like other uh, police authorities across the rest of the UK. So, children's 17 hate crimes in 2016. Uh, only beneath the British Transport Police, Greater Manchester Police and Metropolitan Police, Police Scotland reporting higher than every other police force across the rest of the United Kingdom. Angela Constance. And it is very important that we uh, look at that and test whether the appropriate arrangements and data sharing uh, is in place, because I am conscious that hate crime in all its forms tends to be uh, underreported, uh, and that often the biggest challenge is to, indeed to get people to report hate crime again in, in all its uh, forms. But I'm happy to pick up the specifics of that uh, with Justice colleagues uh, and uh, Police uh, Scotland. So, you know, so I suppose I mean, the facts of the matter are, are very harsh. Uh, we've heard uh, repeatedly that uh, our minority ethnic communities are twice as likely to be unemployed. Uh, there is a huge gap uh, of nearly 15% in the employment rate. And Pauline McNeill's point about having a far closer look uh, at the experience of women in our minority ethnic communities is important because when you look at the gap, uh, just in, in a wee minute, when you look at the gap, uh, between male and female employment in the minority ethnic community, it's 24% in comparison to an employment gap that does indeed, indeed already exist uh, uh, within you know, the rest of the population, but that is much <coughs> exacerbated. Kezia Dugdale. The Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Uh, I wonder if she would accept that one of the most marginalised groups in Scotland are Sikh women. And I wonder if she's had the opportunity to visit the work of Sikh San Jog in Edinburgh, whether she's aware that they constantly face funding problems, whether she might visit them, recognising that if this organisation closes, there won't be a single agency in Scotland to support Sikh women in particular. Angela Constance. I certainly have a, a look at that. I know the member has uh, corresponded uh, with me in the past on that specific organisation, uh, and I have certainly instructed my officers to go and engage uh, with the organisations to see how we could be uh, in, in the sphere uh, of uh, taking a, a can-do approach and, and how we could uh, help. And I'll have another uh, look at that if the situation has uh, re-emerged. Off, the, the facts uh, are indeed stark. I mean, over uh, a third uh, of our ethnic minority communities are in poverty after housing costs. That compares uh, to 18% of the, the, the white uh, British population. And we know uh, that ethnic minority women are hit the hardest uh, by austerity also. And by 2020, they will have lost double the amount of money in comparison to, to, to poor uh, white men. And of course, time and time again, uh, members have spoke very eloquently about the underrepresentation uh, and public life uh, and in, in civic life. In terms of Police Scotland, uh, I know that in terms of their latest recruitment around uh, in September 2017, that 10% of the new recruits uh, were from an ethnic minority background. Uh, but of course, we need to continue that, 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 that progress. And I also had the opportunity recently to engage with the Fair Future uh, Young Persons Project, who had been looking, with the, uh, looking at the, the race equality framework and about how we could work with young people, particularly uh, in the year of young people, uh, to address uh, race inequality again in its many forms. I, actually, I'm not, because I'm really short for time. And I do think it's important, I, I apologise, I do think it's important that I say that I am indeed accepting uh, both 
uh, amendments uh, from the Labour Party uh, and indeed uh, the Conservative uh, Party because uh, I accept that there's a need uh, for robust evidence. That's why we've got our equality uh, evidence uh, strategy. Uh, that, ev that equality evidence strategy is a shared responsibility between Scottish Government, third sector, uh, public sector uh, and indeed academia and it is indeed moving uh, to uh, have far more concrete projects uh, to fill those identified evidence gaps. And there will indeed be an annual race equality summit uh, and there will indeed be a progress report uh, to Parliament in early uh, 2021 because I accept the point that we need to monitor activity to ensure uh, we're having an impact. And the final point I want to end on, presiding officers, is indeed uh, with regards to Gypsy Travellers or indeed Scottish travellers, as uh, John Finney pointed out. And I know that John Finney's uh, amendment wasn't selected, but I have to tell the Chamber that if his amendment had been selected, I would have been back in it today. Because although his amendment uh, says that successive administrations have not uh, effectively uh, changed the long-standing inequalities, I would accept that. I can talk about the progress we have made uh, working together with the Gypsy uh, Traveller uh, community, but we have to accept that we've not done enough or we've not been successful uh, in addressing the long-standing inequalities that this, as somebody says, Indigenous uh, Scottish uh, community continue to experience. They are indeed uh, the last bastion uh, of acceptable racism. And I believe that if you want to change something, You've got to accept it, you've got to own it, you've got to face up to it and say that's our problem and we're determined to address it. I'm determined to address it. I can assure you every member of the ministerial working group is determined to address it. I know Mary Fee's determined to address it and I know John Finney's determined to address it and certainly the members who've participated in this debate today are determined to address it. And I will remember that because we will indeed have to come back to some of the brave, to some of the courageous and some of the hard decisions that we will have to take to challenge attitudes and to make change forever for the most disenfranchised community that exists in Scotland today. Thank you.